Hello and welcome to my amazing talk about running every buzzword you could possibly hear in a single device. EFI, Grub2, Raspberry, all at once. So am I. I'm Alexander Graf, um, this time for real. David was just faking to be me. Um, I'm usually a KVM and QME developer. You might have seen me from things like running KVM in KVM, running OS 10 in KVM, doing KVM on power, th things that people usually seem to take as granted these days. Um, but this time around, I'm going to talk to you as a member of the OpenSUSE ARM team. So um, you saw on the headline uh, the Raspberry Pi. That's what it looks like. You probably, most of you guys have seen one. Um, I just took this image from our web page, so it always also has a logo on it, which is cool. Um, so why, why would you possibly want to buy a Raspberry Pi? That's very, very simple reasons. It's cheap as hell, it's available like nothing else. You can just go to a store, grab it, and it's ARM-based. What, what more could you possibly ask for? But most of you guys probably want to um, run software on such a device, right? So you want to boot, which means you want to get into a system. Um, so how does booting on the Raspberry Pi work? Well, it's, it's really, really simple, right? You take this board, and then you take your SD card, and then you plug your SD card in, and then you take your power cable, and you plug your power cable in down there, and then it just boots. Unless you're the one creating the image that is supposed to make this thing boot, which is what we're here for, right? In the distribution. So let's take a look at the SD card. What does this thing actually look like? What, what do we have in there? You have the usual. Um, we do have, the screen is really dark. Um, we do have uh, our root file system. We do have a swap, peti swap petition. The usual stuff you would expect on, on a, a main device that you run your operating system from. But the Raspberry is special in one regard, in that it also has a fat partition. And that one's very, very mandatory on those devices because the FAT partition actually contains a few files that are incredibly necessary to boot such a device. Um, the really, really most important one is boot code bin um, that just lies around on that FAT partition that just tanks there. Um, and it's so important because that's what is the initial boot code. That comes from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, it's actually GPU code, so the whole thing doesn't boot from the ARM systems, it boots from the GPU. This is GPU code um, that then goes in and reads the config text file, which is also on there, to figure out uh, what it should do, how it, how it should look like, whether it should enable serial ports, what frequencies it should use, what monitor depth it should use. That's all written in config text with defaults, obviously. And we usually, if you have saying, a Raspbian distribution, you also get a kernel on that fat partition that you boot. Which, ever from the very first time we enabled the Raspberry Pi and, and OpenSUSE, um, we figured it was a really bad idea. Uh, so instead, we are using U-Boot at that point. And U-Boot then goes in um, and can actually break out of that fat partition and go into your real root partition and read a script called boot script from there and boot, load the kernel, init.rd, and device tree from your root partition, which means you can actually update files with normal RPMs. How is that different from how your PC boots? Uh, very simple. Your PC boots first off by being a PC and not a Raspberry Pi. Um, and then you have something um, some, some storage where you put your firmware in. On the Raspberry Pi, everything's on the SD card. On a real PC, you have something soldered onto your board where your EFI firmware usually lies. And um, that EFI firmware goes around and just looks at your hard disk, at your storage devices, whatever they are, even your network, and just searches for something it should boot based on different algorithms. Um, it finds something that it can execute and should execute in boot orders, um, which usually in our case for OpenSUSE is GRUB2. Uh, which then uses callbacks into EFI uh, to proceed, load a kernel, run that kernel, and you're good. So you can see it's actually pretty similar to how the Raspberry Pi boots, just that you have a firmware piece of hardware rather than your SD card, and you're not running off a GPU. But other than that, pretty similar. So what is this EFI thing, really? I mean, the whole talk is about running EFI, right? So what, what is EFI and why are people so scared of it? I honestly don't know. Well, why they're scared, but I can tell you what it is. 
the really, really most important crucial core piece of EFI um, is something called the system table, which is just a pointer um, to a struct that has pointers to structs that have pointers to structs that have pointers to structs. And um, all of those contain um, either information or function callbacks. Uh, the most important one of them are the boot time services. That's basically a collection of around 50 function callbacks uh, that you can call into to do different things um, during boot time. Uh, GOP2, for example, uses that, uh, those. I just took a few most important ones out here. Um, obviously, you want to load images, right? So the load image callback, um, you just, if you, want, if you have an image in memory and you just actually want to have it loaded, uh, into uh, into the system, you call the load image function with a uh, binary that, that's EFI compatible. Anybody recognize what this might look like? Y you've seen that thing down there before? Yeah, it's a PE executable. Um, so basically, uh, the same thing that Windows uses. It's the same format. It's a pretty simple format, to be honest. Um, a lot, lot simpler than ELF. Uh, so loading that into memory is, is not too hard. It's really just sections um, that you take and then put into RAM at different locations. And then you got an entry point, jump into it, and that's all you need to do for loading. <clears throat> so loading an image is easy. Um, the other really core piece of EFI is uh, that it has a notion of objects. It doesn't call them objects, and it doesn't ca call classes classes, um, but it is basically the same idea. So you have protocols, which are classes, and handles, which are your objects. Uh, and Imagine you have a disk device, right? You got a SATA disk, your first SATA disk in your, in your system, uh, and that one SATA disk uh, can, can implement a class called a block operation class. You never give names to anything in EFI, they're all based on IDs. You have uh, really long, 128-bit long uh, GU IDs, but this is basically just a class that says I can do block operations, and that consists of just a few function callbacks again, so all of these are structs, right? So this is a struct that basically tells you it's a struct, it's a struct inside a struct, and then in there you have function callbacks that you can uh, call to read or write uh, to such a device. It's very, very simple. Um, and it can also have a second or third or fourth or how many, or how, how many ever you want uh, different classes implemented by the same uh, object. Uh, in the example of a set disk, for example, uh, you usually have a um, thing called a device path. Uh, where you can find out where in your device tree um, this thing is. So this is like my disk is attached to a SATA controller, which is attached to a PCI device, and then you can just l walk through this, this path. So it's really just a, a simple means of, of providing access to objects. Uh, and objects can be arbitrarily uh, enhanced too, so you can, have, you can load enough, another driver that then adds objects to your object list and uh, exposes different devices basically with this. Uh, and you, the next really cool thing that EFI does, which is important for uh, firmware, is it ha manages memory. You, you always want to know which memory in your memory space is already occupied and which isn't. So uh, EFI maintains a memory map that you can always ask for, um, where it basically just says, all right, so at this address, I have some space available. At that address, uh, everything's already occupied. At, the, at this address, um, there's nothing there at all. At that address, we got runtime services. I'll get to this later. Um, and say down here is a lot of memory available again. And if you um, allocate memory, what happens is that EFI basically just goes and says, oh, you want one megabyte allocation? All right. I shrink down an existing uh, available size and add you know, one more blob for your one megabyte allocation, return this thing to you, and that's it. It doesn't do anything beyond this. So if you don't free this, it will still be allocated by the time you exit your application, which, by the way, GRUB2 does. Um, so memory allocation is really simple too. You can always ask for your memory map. You can receive it whenever you like. It's always up to date, so you always know how much memory you still have available for allocations. Uh, console is obvious. It's just pointers to the console objects uh, for standard in, standard out. And additional tables contain uh, fancy things like your device tree or your ACPI tables, your DMI tables, everything that's just arbitrary data that you want to have somewhere in memory and know where it is. Um, it's just put as, uh, with IDs into those arbitrary tables. So it's just tuples of uh, ID and pointer. Runtime services are a really, really cool thing in EFI. Uh, imagine you boot your PC, right? You boot it up and you have a lot of RAM. 
And initially when you boot, of course, EFI is running there, and EFI owns some of that RAM. Now EFI goes and loads Grub, Grub goes and extends itself, allocates a lot more memory, loads Linux into that space, Linux gets loaded into real memory, and then what? Well, then at this point, Linux actually is also an EFI binary that executes and talks to EFI and tells EFI, you know what, EFI, go away. I, I don't need you anymore. Um, I'm, I'm, out of, I, I'm done with booting. I don't need booting anymore. Um, please give me the machine. I want to have access to all of, me, of all of that memory without asking you for it. So it does that. But one thing that you can do with EFI is you can still preserve some of EFI in your memory space um, by having that blob be self-relocatable, and Linux calls you with uh, your new relocation addresses on it. So this blob is still available while Linux is running. So Linux can call into functions inside of that small space, and then um, those EFI runtime services can still do operations on behalf of Linux. So this is code that actually is firmware code that you just call into. And uh, the most obvious examples for one-time services uh, are get time, so you can ask uh, EFI what time it is just to access the real-time clock. You can ask uh, EFI to give you a variable uh, or set a variable. You, you have some variable space in, in EFI, uh, and you can ask it to reset your system, for example. Please reboot now, and you don't need to care about 50 different power management units or whatever you have out there. It just reboots the system. So it's a really uh, convenient hardware abstraction layer for you. All right. So how do we bridge U-Boot and, uh, and EFI? How do, we, how do these interfaces even match? I mean, U-Boot is, is a completely different world, isn't it? It's run for embedded. It doesn't have anything to do with a real cool servers that do have EFI. Well, if we take a really deep look, um, memory management, yes, sure. Um, we, we need to write new code to support all the memory management that EFI exposes in, uh, in U-Boot, because U-Boot doesn't have a notion, or has, has a notion of memory allocations, but it's different from what EFI uh, thinks it should be. Um, but anything else, if you look at the network stack, well, there's a network stack in U-Boot. So if we just write small wrapper code, we can as well just access the U-Boot wrapper code, uh, the U-Boot network code from a random boot time service callback. The same goes for uh, console, for disk, all the devices actually look almost the same on their interfaces if you really compare EFI interfaces and U-Boot internal interfaces. So all we need to do to support calling into U-Boot code from a boot time service function callback is to write a small wrapper um, that just converts function semantics for us. For runtime services, uh, that's slightly more complicated because U-Boot doesn't have any notion at all of runtime services. It only knows how to run at boot time and then tries to just completely disappear. Um, however, uh, it's not really hard to do either. We, we need to basically teach um, a function like the reset CPU function to be runtime service aware. That's a patch of about three to four lines at this point um, per function that we want to call. And uh, at that point, we can just call a wrapper, run the CPU reset function, and you get fully working runtime services in U-Boot. So I have enabled this for uh, Raspberry Pi 3, or Raspberry Pi in general, actually, and the uh, Layerscape 2085 systems. But adding, adding new support is, is really a matter of a couple lines of code, um, so it's trivial. Get time, we don't implement at all. Um, reason is most boards that you have out there don't have a, time to, don't have a clock to ask. If, if you don't have a clock, you, you can't really return a working time. Uh, and same for variables. We, for, if we want to support variables, we would need to support uh, storing variables somewhere and reading variables from somewhere that doesn't collide with what Linux actually uses at the point in time when Linux calls our runtime service code. We don't have those separate devices on most devices that we want to support with this. And for additional tables, very simple. We just put our device tree in there. We have a device tree. We can load the device tree. We put it in there. Done deal. And at that point, we actually have everything we need to execute an EFI binary, right? So if we take a look, this is um, just a boot log from a ZincMP system. It just boots up into, into U-Boot and then gets you to a shell. All right, so what we need to do to boot an EFI binary on these with current U-Boot, so if you just take U-Boot 2016.05, for example, it's all implemented. 
um, all you need to do is uh, load your Grub binary, load your device tree, and call boot EFI. Done. You get a Grub. It's as simple as that. So if you take a current U-boot, um, you can always just manually load an EFI binary, which could be Grub, which could be uh, the Linux kernel itself, it's also EFI binary, can be anything that you like. It could be the uh, OpenBSD bootloader, whatever you prefer. But if, you, if we go back actually and, and take a look at this, um, this excerpt, one thing you might have realized while reading through all of this, uh, these lines here is there's, there's something on down there that's called autoboot. So what, what is autoboot? Autoboot just means that a uh, U-boot goes in and executes uh, a boot script that's predefined in the configuration. And on most systems these days, that's a distro script. It's just a set of templates um, that go through a list of different devices and searches for known good sources of booting from them. So really the distro script just goes in, searches your disk, and looks if it finds a, an EFI binary at the spec-defined removable location path for EFI binaries, that's just part of the EFI spec, um, and searches if it can find a device tree. If it doesn't, it just doesn't load it. And then usually, of course, your uh, EFI binary is grub2. So you don't press any key at all, and it just automatically finds everything, and you get grub which is pretty much how you want to boot these days, right? You don't want to mess with boot scripts, you don't want to mess with anything at all, you really just want to have things work out of the box. So are we standing? Pretty good. Um, as you can see, everything's implemented. So we have EFI objects, we have console support, we have disk support, we, have, we can even do Pixie boot support, I see Pixie boot by now. Um, video support works, so you can see graphical output. Uh, we can run Grub2, we can run Linux. I have not tried to boot Windows yet. There were patches on the mailing list to uh, enable x86-64 um, about two days after I posted my first patch set, so it really is not hard to enable a new architecture, but um, they haven't actually progressed since because the guy was doing something different since then. And I don't know, I don't really care too much about booting Windows right now. If you compare code sizes between enabling EFI support and not enabling EFI support, you can see that the difference is negligible. You, you increase your code size by somewhere between 10 and 20K, which if your code is already 500 kilobytes big, 10 or 20K doesn't really account for anything at all. It's completely negligible, which means that upstream, we now enable by default. So if you just take U-boot and you do a dev config for a board, you get EFI support on today's U-boot. You don't have to mess with anything at all anymore. You don't have to mess with U images, with Z images, with anything. You just run grub and it works. Since I'm telling you that everything works, I should probably also show you that it works, which is more fun. So, so for, the, for the demo, I'm going to uh, plug this Raspberry Pi 3 I got in here into the HDMI connector. And connect power. Let's hope this one works. All right, there you go. So this is, this is U-boot. Uh, this is GUP2 booting up with graphics and everything, all the bells and whistles you would usually uh, know. If you have a USB keyboard attached, you can even use the USB keyboard to edit a command line, do whatever you like. It boots into Linux, and there you go. You get a fully working distribution with just the way you would usually expect it to work, with all the Yast bootloader things working, with all the Perl bootloader updates working. Everything just works the way you would imagine it to have worked from the very first day. I'll just leave it at that one. Um, so the next slide is really just a thank you and go out and try it for yourself. And uh, do you have any questions? Cypher, uh, please get a mic there right next to you. Yes.
What's, what's the idea behind slowing down the Raspberry Pi boot even more with more complicated stuff? I mean, uh, the, the, the one thing, if, if this doesn't work, people will go Googling and ask why it doesn't work. Everybody will tell them to go away. Just boot the Raspberry Pi like it's supposed to boot. It depends on what your goal is. Is your goal to support the Raspberry Pi? Boot the way the Raspberry Pi would do it, does it? If you, if you want to um, really actually do it the Raspberry Pi way, use the downstream kernel, use whatever method you like, I don't care. If you want to boot the Raspberry Pi like you boot any random normal system, if you want to actually go towards a maintainable future, you want to have that path. But then it needs to speed up a lot more because, I mean, it's a hell of a lot slower than, than booting a normal, normal boot rate. There, there was a 10, 10 second timeout, yes, um, it does boot slower, but that's all things that are going to go away. The big advantage of, uh, of this uh, UUMI enablement in particular for the Raspberry Pi is here that you now have a boot menu to select different kernels because the way it worked before is that uh, when we updated a kernel and the new kernel for some reason didn't work like some kernel head and then you were kind of stuck and you now had to take the SD card and you know put it into a different machine, tweak siblings and so on and now with this you know couple seconds more in the boot process, you can just select a different kernel if the default selection doesn't work and you still have a working system. You can also edit command lines on the fly from the bootloader. It, it just basically moves your Raspberry Pi from a device that you target to a device that you work on. That's, that's basically the shift. It goes from, this is something like an embedded device, like a mobile phone that I just want to cross-compile things on my PC on and then push them onto the device over towards this is the device I'm actually working with and working on. You, you would never imagine to uh, directly flash your kernel into your, your flash chip on your PC, would you? Well, maybe you would, but nobody else who is sane would. So, um, would this also mean that if you have ButterFS and the snapshots that it's all just working? Yep, all just working. ButterFS, okay. snapshots, snapshot rollback booting, all of that just works out of the box. The other question I have is around Pixie Boot. Um, so Pixie Boot is not implemented by the firmware in that case, so it's really done on the U UFI side? Or okay, um, it's probably just a, a, a naming problem. Um, EFI is the specification that tells you how to implement these interfaces. U-Boot implements that uh, specification and Tiano Core implements that specification. You can use both to boot your system, and at that point, because you're booting your system from those pieces of software, they become your firmware. So, on the Raspberry Pi, um, U-Boot is my firmware. On your PC, a Tiano Core-based fork from your vendor is your firmware. It's just a naming, naming thing. And that firmware implements EFI. Or actually, it implements UEFI because it's 2.0. But it'll work. That's the important part. Yeah. Say again. Um, Pixie boot will just work. That's that's the important part. Yeah. Well, the, the point about this is it, it it won't be any different from a PC at that point. Yeah. If as, as soon as you have your your U boot on there, it will behave as a as a PC does, or like the overdrives that we saw earlier do, just at a much lower price point. More questions. Size of relief. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs>